Hey, Numa family, so good to see you today. Thank you for gathering with us online. I'm excited. We're going to have an amazing time in the Word today. But before we do that, let's take a moment. Let's get still. Let's get quiet before God because he's here and he's ready to move and speak. Uh, let's do that and let's just invite him in wherever we're watching from today. Let's invite him in. Let's quiet ourselves. So close your eyes. Don't worry about what's going on around you. And let's just invite the Lord in. He's already here. He's ready to speak. Uh, but let's just take some time and just to pause for a minute. God, we thank you. We thank you that you are here with us today. We thank you that you are not caught off guard by any circumstance or challenges that's going on in our life. We trust you. Uh, we trust you with uh, our life. Uh, we trust in your guidance. We trust in your leadership. Uh, so would you come and minister to us today? We love you. We honor you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Guys, today I'm going to be in 1 Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 3, and I'm going to read a small portion of Scripture. But before you go there, I have a long introduction <laughs> to 1 Samuel. There's a lot that's going on and that's happening here. So if you'll go ahead and you'll, you'll scroll or turn uh, to that passage, uh, then we're going to jump into it. So what's happening in the beginning of 1 Samuel is we see there's a woman named Hannah. And Hannah is barren. She can't have children. And during this time, uh, she would be seen as less than because of this. And so she is ridiculed. Um, she also has a perception of herself and her value within society. Her husband has another wife. That's a whole other story <laughs> that he's married to named Penina. And it says that Penina is provoking her. So she's not letting Hannah outlive this thing that she's unable to control. Each year they would make the trip to Shiloh to give an offering to the Lord and to make a sacrifice. It was an annual uh, trek that they would make. And as they would go there, Penina would remind her again. So she's, she's living in this, this drama day after day after day and be, being reminded of what she can't produce, what she, what she doesn't have. And so one year she finds herself going through the same thing and she's in anguish, she's in pain, she's devastated. She goes to the temple and she begins to cry out to the Lord. She begins to cry out so much that the people around her, it looks like that she may be a little drunk. She may be a little tipsy. <laughs> and so Eli, the priest, he sees it. He goes over to her and he's like, hey, you can't be carrying on like this in the temple. You better get yourself sorted out. And she's like, but I'm not drunk. I know it may look like it, but this is my issue. I am, I'm barren. I'm unable to have children. This other lady is provoking me like I'm, it's difficult. All I want is a child. So she shares her issue with him. And then Eli, he, he just encourages her. He just encourages her. And he says, go in peace and may the Lord grant your request. Shortly after this, Hannah, she goes, she has child. She begins to wean the child. The child becomes an, a, a, a young adult. And she takes the child back to the temple where Eli is serving. She she fulfills her vow, her promise that she made to God, which is if you allow me to have this child, I'll bring this child and he'll serve you all the days of his life. So this is happening. Samuel is ministering. Things are going good in his life. His mom continues to visit him each year and connect with him. So while this is happening, Eli has two sons. They are in the, the, the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. But his sons are doing some bad stuff. His sons have this position as, as priests and as stewards of God's things, but they do not honor God. The things of God, they, they, are, they are in contempt against them. So, so they're, they're sleeping with women. They're pulling the offerings off the altar before they're able to burn. They're doing all these things in this very sacred and holy place. And as people are coming, casting their burdens and trying to honor God, they are dishonoring it. The word gets back to Eli, who's their father. And he confronts them with the information that he gets. And he says, hey, I've heard these things. What's going on? Why is this happening? Why are you doing these wicked things? So he, he confronts them with the information, but he doesn't stop it. He doesn't stop it from happening. So he allows his sons 
to continue in this way. Not long after this, a prophet comes and, and, and speaks directly to Eli. And he said, hey, because you have chosen to dishonor God and you've allowed these things to continue to go on with your family, God is going to cut you guys off from the priesthood. There's going to be people in your family. They're going to be in their prime and they're going to die because of what is happening, what you have chosen to do. He says you're also going to be without strength. You, you're going to be weakened. You, these things are going to happen in your life and you're not going to be able to, to carry on. So he gives Eli this strong word and these things begin to happen and take place. And while this is going on, Samuel continues to minister. And this is where we're going to pick up here in the scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And I'm reading uh, verses 1 through 3 in the NIV. It says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was was. And may God add his blessing to the reading of the word today. God, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that it is alive. That means that it's, it's not dead what we're reading. It's, it's not just for that time, but it's for today. It's alive. It's active. It's moving and doing things in our heart. And it's speaking. It's speaking into our situation. It's speaking in, into our society, um, into our communities. And we just receive it today. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. Minister to our hearts. Go into those places that we've locked up. We've thrown away the key and bring healing, bring restoration, bring hope, bring correction where there needs to be correction. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Last week, uh, we started some conversations, a talk, a series around wanting God. Wanting God. And I mentioned how oftentimes or sometimes in our conversations, our prayer life, we can be going to God and it's just request. It's request after request, burden after burden, challenge after challenge. And those things are real. And those are things that we we want to communicate with God and the things that are on our heart. And God asks us, he instructs us to cast our burdens upon him. In casting our burdens upon him, we can get lost in that. And what happens is we stop wanting God. We stop seeking God just to be with him. So we're talking to him because we want things from him or we want him to do things for us. But we lose the essence of the relationship is to connect, is to be together, is to embrace each other. We, we lose the desire and it just becomes about our wants, and we actually become centered in our communication and our conversation with God. But he desires much more with us. He desires relationship with us, just like he came looking for Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day to communicate and to commune with them. And I think there's some uh, amazing things that we can take from this passage of scripture today that we can apply in our own life about how Samuel positioned himself. The scripture says that Samuel was ministering to God and he was ministering to God because his mom had made a vow about his life. She had told God, she said, if you give me this child, I'll commit him back to you. I'll give him back to you and he'll serve you all the days of his life. Now, this is the words of his mother. But now Samuel has made a decision to live out those words. He's made a decision to, to actually commit himself to the words that his mother has spoken. So he does have a choice. So even though his mother has dropped him off and left him at the, at the temple and put him under the leadership of Eli, there still is a choice that he makes about whether he wants to step into this and live this out or not. Just like Eli's sons who were in the Levitical priesthood, there's been a word that's been spoken over their family. They are also making a choice. Their choice is to abuse, their choice is to harm, their choice is to create an unhealthy environment for people to come and to serve and worship God. But Samuel is choosing to do different. Samuel is choosing not to minister to himself 
and think about himself, <laughs> but he's choosing to minister to the Lord. So we see these, these two uh, groups of individuals who have words spoken over their family and over their life, but they're making very different choices. Samuel's also under the leadership of Eli. Eli is the one who's responsible for creating the environment, for leading, for guiding, for protecting, for helping form and shape both of these groups of individuals. So even though Eli has not created and helped facilitate the most healthiest environment, Samuel doesn't allow that to disconnect him from God. And maybe some of us, we have allowed this to happen. We have allowed experiences. We have allowed circumstances. We have allowed hurts and pains from unmet expectations from leaders and from people to keep us disconnected and from ministering to the Lord. The scripture also says that the, the word was rare. And where the, the word is rare, it, it, it allows for an environment for people to, to do whatever they think is best. So God has given us the word to help lead us, to help guide us, to help give us his, his, his covenant and, and his directions for us for life. And when we don't have that, when it's, when it's rare, Right. We, we are left to ourselves to figure out things for our own and, and we come up with our own truth. It reminds me a lot of the times that we live in today. When you hear people say, this is my truth, I'm just going to live by my truth and do what I feel is necessary and right and what benefits me. The, the word of God was not palatable. It was it was not being received. It doesn't say that there wasn't the word, that it wasn't accessible and that it wasn't available for people to connect with. It says that it was rare. People did not want to receive it, but they wanted to live by their own guidance, their own instruction. They wanted to do whatever they wanted to do with their sexuality, with their bodies, with their time. They wanted to create their own purpose for themselves and live that out in whatever would serve them. It also said that there were no visions. It's interesting that in Acts 2.17, it says, in the last days... God is going to pour out his spirit and he's going to give dreams and visions. So this is his answer to the darkness that will take place in the last days. Here, as we read in, it says there's no visions. So people have no hope beyond their present. They, have, they cannot see beyond their, their now. So this is an environment where there's no, the word is rare. So people are living by their own truth. They're guiding themselves figuring out for themselves what is right. No word and no vision. And this is an environment that creates a lot of toxic, toxicity. toxicity. Uh, this is an environment where men and women become lovers of themselves and they begin to think and do what is right in their own eyes. In my coaching journey, I was I started off as a graduate assistant coach. And this is um, it's, it's interesting because you're not a full time coach, but you're not a player. <laughs> but you still because you are still in that young kind of phase and entry level position, you're still able to connect with players and build some really intimate and unique relationships. And so I would do that quite a bit. Um, one of the things that I loved about coaching football is I could use this thing that young men were passionate about to help invest and impact their lives in a very, very positive way. And so anytime I had an opportunity to do that, I would do it, I would use it. And I remember there was this one young man, he was a freshman, he was 17, 18 years old, and he had just came to university, was a part of our team, but you could tell he was very influential. Like people listened when he spoke. He just had this type of impact when he stepped into a room People were around him, following him, connecting with him. There was something about him. But it wasn't just his charisma. It, it, it wasn't just his good looks. It wasn't just his charm. Uh, it wasn't his riz. There was something on his life. There was a call of God on his life. I could see it. It was very clear. So even in his young age and maybe uh, didn't say all the right things all the time or do all the right things, you could see 
there was something upon him. God wanted to do something unique with him. And over time, I was able to develop a relationship with him, learn more about his story. And in learning more about his story, he revealed to me that he was a PK. He was a preacher's kid. And I was thinking to myself, I knew it. I knew there was something unique about this kid. So he's a, he's a preacher's kid. And he began to tell me a little bit about his family dynamics. Uh, he has preachers, pastors, reverends, ministers, you name it, all throughout his family. There's this, uh, this call of God on his family and throughout his lineage. But in the same breath, there was also gangsters, drug dealers, um, people who got into some really messed up and like dark stuff. But there was no in between. It was either pastor or drug dealer. It was either preacher or gangster. It, it, it was interesting that there was no in between. It was, it was good or bad, right or wrong, a healthy, unhealthy dynamic in his family. And you could see in his life that he was wrestling with this. So there was a call of God upon his family and upon his life to lead and influence and be a, a, a positive force in people's life and help reconcile them with God, but he was wrestling with it. In the scripture, we see Samuel and we see Eli's sons both have a calling, but they have a choice that they have to make and if they're going to live it out. This is where this young man was at that I was journeying with and connecting with. There was something unique about him. There were prayers that had been prayed over his life. There were promises that he can walk in. There was a covenant with God, with him and his family. But he's having to make a choice about what he wanted to do. Samuel makes the choice to minister to God. Not to minister to himself, but to minister to God, to be faithful to God, to be a servant of God, to be a steward of God. He's under Eli's leadership, but Eli's not in great condition. It talks about Eli's sight. So his, his, his sight is physically diminishing. He's, he's, he's unable to see clear. This not only speaks about his, his physical sight, but also his spiritual sight. He has lost his discernment. He has lost his ability to be able to, to see things beyond the reality. There's, there has something that has been lost spiritually in him, his, his hunger, his appetite, his willingness to be able to connect with God, his engagement with, with God. There's, there's something that has been lost. He is aging. Um, although he is seasoned and full of wisdom, that there's something that he is losing in his journey. So he's not in great shape. There's physical attributes and, and spiritual attributes that are diminishing in his life. And it's interesting that even though these things are happening, it says that in the evening, Eli goes to his usual space. He's laying down in his usual space. This speaks to his complacency. It speaks to his, his, his level of comfort. It speaks to his, his, his unwillingness to do anything about where he was at in his life, with his physical sight or with his own spirituality. He, it, it's, it's like he's almost given up or he doesn't care. He just got a prophetic word from the man of God that says, hey, you've dishonored God. You've dishonored God by allowing your sons to continue to do these things. Your family's going to be cut off. Nobody in your family's going to live in their prime. You're going to lose strength. It's, it's almost like he has, he has given up and there's no hope. So he's in a place of complacency. Spiritually, he's in a place of complacency about what he's going to do next. He has no vision for, for the future. He's just kind of stuck. And maybe... Some of us, we find ourselves in the same place. We look at Eli and we look at him with eyes of judgment and we like, how would you allow yourself to like get to this place? 
but we ourselves are on the same journey. We're on the same road or path of where Eli is at. We have lost vision. We've lost sight. We have no more hunger. We have no more appetite for God. We're in a position and everything looks good on the outside, but internally we're not doing the things that we need to do to stay connected with God. Our fire is not burning. We're not hot anymore. We, we actually lukewarm. And we've grown into a place spiritually where we're very complacent. We're just in our usual space. We're just maintaining our spiritual life and what's going on. And there's no desire. There's no want for God. I had an opportunity to work for a, a mentor of mine. And I was so looking forward to the opportunity because this man is amazing. He's kind. I think when you engage with him, you experience the fruit of the spirit in his life. And so I'm going into this place with high expectations. And so I go in and very quickly I find that the environment is not a great environment. You have people backbiting, people stabbing each other in the back, fighting for position. There's just a lot of unhealthy stuff that was going on in the office. And it was very discouraging because I'm thinking to myself, like, how can this man, <laughs> how can I experience this through this man? But under his leadership, this is what is happening in, in the environment. And I was like, surely he doesn't know about this. He doesn't know about these things that's going on. There's, there's no way because that's not how he, he carries himself. But I found out <laughs> he, he did know. He did know about these things that were going on. He, he did know about the chaos. He did know about the, the, the backbiting and the toxic things that were happening. But he just didn't have the strength to actually address them. He was in his latter seasons of life. He was heading towards retirement. And so he just didn't have the passion. He just didn't have the, the energy to want to engage with, with some of the things. And so people were actually harmed from his unwillingness or his inability to actually engage with what was happening. He also, he didn't have any vision for the company moving forward. He would even say it out loud. He's like, I, I just don't have vision for where we're going next. He only could see what was, what was happening in the present. But he wasn't dreaming. He wasn't visionarying about what was the next step for the company. And I think with, the, with these two things combined, with his unwillingness to uh, address some of the toxic things that were going on, and his, his inability to be able to have any vision for the company and how it's going to move forward, it just created chaos. It created chaos. And my mentor, like, was, even though he was a, a, a good person and a great man, wasn't in a good space. There were some things that were diminishing in his, in his life. And because of it, other people were, were suffering. It was affecting other people. I love, 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 love what the scripture says next. It said, but the lamp of God had not yet gone out. In the midst of the word being rare, in the midst of there being no visions, in the middle of a, a, a leader who's, who's diminishing, who, 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 who is getting older and and who doesn't have any vision. And, and his sons, who are supposed to be the, 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 the heirs, the parents that would take over, who are doing these wicked things, they're sleeping with women, they're stealing the, the offerings off the altar, even as they're, they're, they're burning. Even in the middle of all these things, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Wherever you find yourself today, there's, there's still hope. God is still moving in the darkness. God is still moving in the confusion within our society. God is still moving in a place where people laugh at the Bible and they think it's foolishness and they think it's, it's, it's ignorant and, and intelligent. People don't engage with the Bible. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. The lamp of God was placed in the holy place. It was placed typically behind a curtain which was covering the ark of God, the ark of the covenant. 
And so the light was there so the priest could come and they could minister and go back and forth during the evening time. In Leviticus, God instructs the priest. He says, keep this lamp burning continuously. Day and night, night and day, you need to keep this lamp going. You need to keep it burning. So it's burning, but it's, it's, it's almost like there's a flicker. I can see it flickering, going, going in and out, but it's still burning. And guess who we find who has positioned themselves by the ark of God? It's Samuel. Samuel has chosen to place himself. He's chosen to sleep. Guys, not just, not just stand there for a time period. Samuel is sleeping by the ark of God. He's sleeping by this, this lamp. There's something inside of Samuel. There is a hunger. There is a, there's a deep desire. There is a longing to want to connect with God, to be with God, to be in his presence. God had even not yet even spoke to Samuel. He had never heard the voice of God. But there's something inside of Samuel that says, I'm going to lay my head by the ark of God. I'm going to sleep here. I'm going to pursue God. I'm going to connect with God. I'm going to position myself in a way for God to have a loving encounter with me. That is what I want. That is, that is my desire. And Samuel is not doing this based off what is happening going on around him. He didn't, he, he didn't allow that the word was rare to keep him from positioning himself. He didn't allow that, that individuals didn't have vision to keep him from placing himself there. He didn't allow the leadership that he was under to keep him from having a hunger from God. He didn't allow the models and, and, and the, the brothers that he had seen who were supposed to actually be there keeping the lamp burning. He didn't allow their actions. He didn't allow their behavior. He didn't allow their reputation to keep him from wanting God, from desiring God. And maybe some of us, we have allowed these things to keep us from pursuing and entering the presence of God to make our bed at the place where he would visit us, where he would encounter us. And my prayer in my heart for us is that we would have a desire that something would be stirred in our hearts like Samuel, where we would position ourselves in a way where God would meet us. He would meet our appetite. He would meet our hunger as we live out the words and the promises that have been spoken over our life prayers that have been prayed from our grandmothers and our grandfathers, things that have been spoken over our family name that we get to step into, that we would position ourselves to meet with God so he could speak to us about our life, so he, so he could affirm us, so he could tell us who we are. But it starts with us wanting God. It starts with us wanting God. I want to challenge us today. I want to challenge us today. I mean, let's position ourselves like Samuel. Regardless of, of what you see going on around you, regardless of maybe failed leadership, regardless of maybe expectations that you have for people who disappointed you, that's maybe even made you question your faith or walk away from your faith. Let's position ourselves like Sam, Samuel and let's lay our heads at the ark of God. Let's pursue God. Let's desire God. Let's want God. Let's remember what this thing is about and why we're doing what we're doing. And let's allow God to, to speak to us, to minister to us as we minister to him. Bow your heads, I want to pray with you. God, we thank you. Uh, we thank you that you're here speaking to us today. Maybe there's some things that we heard and, and they resonate with us, they connect with us. Maybe it's something we've never even spoken out loud to somebody. But as the scripture was being read, as we reflect on the life of, of Samuel and these different individuals within this passage, Maybe we can see ourselves in them. Maybe it's the complacency of Eli. Maybe we've 
found ourselves off track doing some of the things that Eli's sons were doing. God, we thank you that today, because of the work of Christ, because he, he, he gave up his life, that we can repent, we can turn from our ways, we can turn from the things that we are doing, and we can pursue you. God, would you rekindle uh, our fire? Will you help us grow a, a, a deep and a longing desire for you to want you? God, to position ourselves like Samuel. That's our heart. That's our prayer for ourselves as individuals, but also for our community. May we be a community that is in that place, regardless of what's happening and what's going on around us. May we position ourselves in a way where we commune with you and where you encounter us and you speak to us. And it's out of that that everything else would flow in our lives. We pray these things and we seal them in Jesus' name. Amen.